Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this video. I am Infinity43. Today we're looking at an absolutely beautiful car from Historic F1 and an interesting model in terms of presentation, the Ferrari 312 F1. Let's get straight into it. Ferrari have some absolutely beautiful race cars in their history. The P4, the F333, the F40, the F2007, the list could go on. They know how to create art on wheels. In my opinion, today's subject is no different. The 312 F1. The combination of that old school simplistic Formula 1 design coupled with those massive tires and that iconic red finish, it's just absolute motorsport. Beauty and power all at once. Ferrari raced the 312 in Formula 1 from 1966 to 1969. Designed by Mauro Forgieri, the name 312 came from the 3 liter V12 engine, an engine size that was introduced to Formula 1 in 1966. For the first year of new regulations, Ferrari actually used a 3.2 liter engine from their P2 prototypes, modified to 3 liters and mounted to the 312 body. Hardly ideal as this meant the engine was heavier than it needed to be. Nevertheless, John Surtees managed to win the Belgian Grand Prix in that year. Bear in mind this was the spa circuit before the many modifications to reduce speed and length. Surtees left the team when he felt their focus on Le Mans and competing against Ford was pulling their attention away from F1. And so Mike Parks stepped in. One more win arrived in 66 at Monza thanks to Ludovico Scarfiotti. For 1967 the car was improved, but truth be told this is a dark year in Ferrari's history. Lorenzo Bandini crashed heavily at Monza, eventually succumbing to his injuries a few days later. Mike Parks was once again brought in, only to suffer a serious crash at Spa that ended his career. You can see why the racetrack modifications started to arrive soon after this era, which is so dangerous. With no win and fifth in the Constructors' Championship, it was truly one to forget for the prancing horse. Onward then to 1968, and things improved a little bit. Young driver Jackie X claimed a victory at the rainy French Grand Prix, but the introduction of aerodynamic assistance, seen on the 312 with the raised rear wing for example, meant that the development game changed. Much like modern day regulation changes as we had this year in 2022, becomes a bit of a lottery to see who can improve Foster's. Ferrari weren't the lucky ones, so by the end of the season they were fourth in the Constructors' Championship. This chapter of Ferrari history is interesting. Ford had muscled them out of Le Mans success, so much so that Ferrari withdrew entirely within a few years, and they're only returning now in 2023 to top tier competition. F1 success was missing during this time. Drivers and team managers quit pretty regularly. By the end of 1968, Enzo Ferrari had sold his road car business to Fiat for $11 million, primarily to keep the racing team afloat and rebuild it. Now that rebuild would continue throughout 1969, meaning the 312 F1 never got the glory it might have deserved. And so with a restructured team, Ferrari replaced the 312 F1 with the 312B in 1970. Okay, so what I'd like to do now, which is different from my usual format, is to actually unbox this model so you can see how it is presented. It's a little bit different to the usual, so we've got this uh, pretty cool Ferrari box. It's a bit scuffed and uh, you know, uh, it's secondhand, but uh, yeah, pretty cool. A Hot Wheels model, according to the back. So uh, let's open this up. And inside we have this uh, rather attractive tin, which doesn't come out very easily. Uh, so give me a sec. Uh, we'll do this in real time because uh, then you can see how hard it is uh, to get it out. This is taking longer than it should. Oh my goodness. So it's it's really properly in there. This is why I don't take this model out very often. 
Oh, we're just gonna leave it in there because it's not coming out. Uh, but inside we have this tin and we have this uh, presentation over here uh, and uh, a pretty cool looking uh, tin. And then if we take uh, this piece of plastic off, we've got uh, the actual model and some fluffy, what looks like dog hair. I assume the previous owner had a dog. And the model is then inside very neatly presented. Uh, and there it is. So uh, an interesting um, method of, of presenting the model because uh, really it's not the easiest thing to display. But we'll talk more about that in the review. Now I don't really know what to do with these sorts of models. How do you display them? If you open the tin they get dirty. If you leave the plastic on top you can't see it. In fact leaving the car in the can makes it pretty much invisible too. So I suppose you could transfer the car to a regular display box. That's probably the best option. But then what do you do with all the stuff that comes with the car? I don't know. I just find it odd. It's a cool idea, but from a display perspective, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And if you're buying these, you want to display them. I don't know, but weird to me. Anyway, for this review, I'm focusing mainly on the car itself, ignoring the paraphernalia that comes with it. Now, once again, and I didn't know this until I started shooting, once again, we have an IXO creation. They are everywhere. This one does feel a bit like what the IXO Premium X models should be. The model is gorgeous. That paint color just jumps out. When I reviewed the Red Bull RB12 a few episodes ago, and I'll link that in the description, I floated the idea that the simpler the model is, the better they come out. And to me, this model supports that notion. Decals look great, they are clear, they are crisp. I love the engine and the exhaust detail. For some reason I really like the Firestone logo on the tires. It's so gloriously old school. Cockpit detail is also better than usual for the size. I do like the small booklet that accompanies the model. I know I just went on about all the paraphernalia, but I do like the booklet. If you are a motorsport enthusiast, and if you are collecting models like these, you probably are an enthusiast. These books are interesting and they are cool to have. In fact, this model is cool to have, but you might need to find a creative way of displaying it if you want to really enjoy it. Maybe something like this would work well. I don't use closed cabinets, so for now mine stays inside the tin until I have a way of displaying it where it won't get totally dirty. But it definitely deserves to be seen, so I think I should start making a plan.